thank you all so much for joining us today. On behalf of Craft America, we're so thrilled to have Fern with us giving this fantastic talk. Again, we encourage you to share your questions with us um, in the chat or Q&A. And at the end, Fern will be addressing all of those. Pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Fern. Thank you, Emily. Uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, I titled this talk, Finding the Feminine Principle at the Bottom of the Well. And the reason I did that is because as I became an adult and have lived my life, uh, I think to me, the world was so defined by the masculine. And I wanted to know what the feminine was if it was defined by me for myself. The feminine has been, even that was defined by the masculine. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm gonna show you images of some examples. And I'm gonna show you my work, the history of my work. So to start, um, what I've come to about the feminine is that she is what seeks consciousness. Um, I think she also, <clears throat> excuse me, serves deep values and she knows what needs to be done. We want to think about what we want to do, but she knows what needs to be done, not what we want, but what is necessary. So I'm going to start with a couple of examples of that. Uh, Adam and Eve. Th these are two examples from the Old Testament. And I think this whole idea that Eve was original sin, I think is such a wrong doing. I think um, what I want to say about her is that when the serpent, I mean, I'm sure we all know um, the story of Adam and Eve. So I'm not gonna go into it, but what I wanna focus on is when the serpent comes to her and asks her if she thinks, you know, God has said that they will die if they eat from the tree of knowledge because they will learn good and evil. And the snake says to her, you will not die. Your eyes will be open when you, if you eat from this tree. And she looks at the tree and she sees that it looks good for food. And, she, and it is good to look at, it's good for food to eat, and it will bring wisdom. So the serpent does not push her into eating the apple. She chooses to eat the apple. She takes the apple from the tree and eats it and she gives it to Adam and he eats it. And of course, once they do that, they can't stay in the garden any longer. But she brought this to the world. And I think what she brought is very valuable because they have to leave the garden. We can't remain children all our lives. We have to live in the world. We want to grow, we want to develop, uh, we want to create in the world. If we had stayed in the garden, we would have had none of that. So I want to say that to me, she represents for me the beginning of consciousness. And the second story I want to just mention, which I think we all know also, also from the Old Testament, is the story of Isaac and Rebekah and their two sons, Esau and Jacob. So when Rebekah is pregnant with Esau and Jacob, uh, she asks God, why are they fighting in my womb? And God in essence tells her that I'm trying, I, I'm thinking maybe there's a four, but I'm, I, I can't remember the four. So I'm just gonna say, in essence, what God tells her is that the elder will serve the younger. And I think that's very important. So she hears God's message and she understands that the elder will serve the younger. So when Isaac is old, he wants to bring Esau to him because, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, Esau is the oldest. <clears throat> but Esau is the less developed of the two. Esau is a hunter. He's very much of the earth, um, but he's outdoors. Jacob is brought more uh, indoors. He's more reflective. 
He knows more about humanity, you know, and human interactions. So when Isaac calls for Esau, Rebecca sends Jacob. And here's this idea of what needs to be done and not what you want. Isaac wants Esau. The tradition says that Esau should be the inheritor. But Rebecca breaks with that tradition, which I think the feminine can do. She can break with the tradition and she puts Jacob in there and Isaac ends up blessing Jacob. And what's interesting to me too is when Esau comes, he cannot be blessed. Isaac cannot take the blessing away from Jacob. So Jacob becomes the leader and not, and not Esau. I also want to say, and I don't know if I've said this already, when I talk about the feminine or the masculine, excuse me, there's sirens outside. Uh, when I talk about the masculine and the feminine, I'm not talking about men and women. I'm talking about principle, a principle, an energy. There's a masculine energy, there's a feminine energy, and they both live in everybody. So I'm saying to me, when I see somebody who has deep values, I'm seeing the feminine in action. When I see somebody who knows what needs to be done and isn't self-serving, I'm seeing the feminine. So thank you. So I'm gonna begin the images. And I'm fascinated by the snake. I'm fascinated that she's not scared of the snake. I'm kind of scared of snakes. Uh, but they're also incredibly beautiful. So I wanted to just give you a couple of examples of something so part of nature. So to me, I've been asking myself lately about what does a snake mean? And I think it's almost the furthest thing from human awareness. You know, uh, it, it slinks along the earth, you know. Um, Anyway, it's become a very fascinating image for me and I have drawn it several times in my life. So here's another image of a serpent. Also kind of amazing, I've never seen this image before and that it can be so colorful. So these are uh, uh, from a book uh, created by Catherine M. Sanford, who was a Jungian analyst. She lived between 1917 and 2017. And over 30 years, she developed these 62 paintings and it's called, the book is called The Serpent and the Cross. So here is a relationship between, almost in my mind, Eve and the, Eve and the serpent. And this is how it functioned in, in, in Katie. So you can see again, the serpent on, on the tree uh, with this woman and the apple is light. And then this figure down below, which I, I, I don't understand myself, um, but obviously was important to her. And here, what's so interesting is how the serpent then becomes a container for the woman. And this last image from her book, uh, these intertwined serpents within the frame of the woman. And I wanna go to a series of images by Hilma of Klint. And she did these series of eight paintings, they're watercolors. Uh, they're not very large, maybe, I don't know, like maybe 14 inches high, something like that. She did a series of eight. I'm going to show you four. And this was her series called The Tree of Knowledge. And she's a very interesting painter. She uh, it's, was, she's, was Swedish. She lived between 1862 and 1944. And of course, now she's getting a lot of attention because she evidently became a, an abstract painter before Kandinsky, who has been credited with being the first abstract painter, contemporary painter. So these are some images from Hilma of Klint, and this is her view of the tree of knowledge.
now we're going to go into, um, these are my drawings. So since the early 1970s, I've been doing what I call psychological drawings and I um, never shown them. I do them just for myself and I do them to have a relationship with my own inner life. So this is the first one and I'm showing it because it's a very early one. It's from 1971 and it's this woman with her bird. And I, it's hard even for me to tell exactly how the bird fits in. He's either protecting her or he's part of her or, um, but they're, they're one and the same. So in the drawings, um, this is one from 1982, I'm showing you this series where I was dealing, not series, just different drawings where I was dealing with serpents. Um, and a lot of times in the drawings, a fish will enter, which you see on the left. On the right, there's this bird. So here, the serpent is coming out of her head. So it's coming out of my head. And another one, uh, the serpent now is part of the tree. If you can see it rising on the right. And here again, uh, either in front of the tree or part of the tree and becoming kind of feminine. Oh, let me go back for a second because what was interesting, if you can see the serpent is taking a drip from the tree from the right, if you see its right hand and it's putting it into a container. So what happens in my drawings, I usually see an image that really, and I don't plan any of this, and I'm not thinking about how it looks. I just want to get the story. And so all of a sudden there's this container, you can see it dripping into the container. So I became very interested in the container, like what is going on in this container. So here it is again. <clears throat> Here the serpent now is rather feminine. And here's the container which you know, becomes the central image or a very important image. Again, here's another, I would call him a cross between a serpent and a cross. And I thought I was making this, this big cliff, the brown behind it is this cliff. But then I noticed that that red looks very familiar. So there's a few drawings before this, but then I, it ended here where it becomes a woman, the serpent is kind of masculine and uh, they, are, they each have their own power here and they are kind of, um, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're, they can't hurt each other. They both have equal power and they can stand equal. I think she was threatened in the beginning, but now she's quite strong and um, they're very equal. So there's the mystical tradition of Judaism and it has its own uh, sort of God system. And I'm fascinated by that system. So instead of thinking of this, you know, Lord, whatever, I'm interested in this idea of the many sides of God and it goes from the feminine to the masculine. And I think that's very important. I think they're equal and I think it's a beautiful contrast between these different parts. So at the top, there's the crown and this is my drawing. I draw it a lot, <laughs> it appears in a lot of my drawings. Uh, so there's understanding on the left, there's wisdom on the right, there's judgment, which is very masculine, there's grace, which is very feminine, harmony, beauty to me, which is feminine, majesty, which is more masculine, endurance to me, which is a very feminine trait, the righteous one, foundation, and the presence, the earth, the Shekinah, which is this feminine presence that comes to earth. She brings the image of God to earth. I see the crown as the masculine kind of the, I don't know, Lord's side of it or whatever. And she is the presence on earth. So these are just some examples of drawings that I've made of the Sephira. And 
And now, of course, it becomes a woman. I mean, it's totally contained within the woman. I hope you can see it. You know, it goes from the bottom all the way up to her throat. And I deal a lot with the spine, which to me is a strength. You know, if you have a straight spine, it means that I'm centered or it's, it's a centered image. So now we go also, um, this is my view of the feminine and I love it. She's creating music out of her own body and the music here is coming out of her hands but it's also attached up here in the chest. So she's playing her music by the tree. And then she is the tree. The tree is part of her. And I would say the tree of knowledge. And the earth. I mean, the tree means so many different things. So here again, you see the Sephiro coming into this container. And to me, this is a very beautiful drawing. When I drew this, I felt, oh my goodness, peace or some kind of calm, you know, a, a, a place to be. And I wanted to give this example and one other example because it never stays that way. So this was done in August of 21. And this was done, oh, you can't even see it. I can't see it. I, it but this was done in the beginning of 22 when we came into chaos. So you can be calm for a while. And then, you know, there's an inner agitation and the world was, you know, the world's been falling apart, you know, let's face it. Um, and this is where I face it. I face it in my drawings. And there is a serpent again. So here's the serpent. Um, and I'm now doing the second drawing in this series. And if you can see, there's a um, kind of a fleshy figure that all of a sudden appeared in this mess. And I'm drawing that figure at the moment, trying to see what that is. So now we go to my work. So this is the history of my work. Um, ah, this is one of the first pieces I made. I was at Long Beach State. I was weaving on a loom. I started out thinking that I was going to be a painter and I happened to walk into somebody's studio. Who knows? I, it's such, it was such a strange thing because it was on Melrose, on the side of Melrose, it's not very you know, popular. And it was very early on before Melrose even became known. I don't know why I was there. I don't know why his studio door was open, but he had looms, he had weavings on the wall. And I fell in, I just wanted to learn how to weave. I ended up at Long Beach State for a year. I wove this rug there and that's in the exhibit. It's about six feet long. And around 1971, uh, I had met Joan Austin at Long Beach State and she was at Cranbrook and she was learning how to do these off loom uh, fiber techniques. And I went to meet her for lunch one day. Uh, again, you're t I, I feel like my life has been taken along a thread. I just, I end up in these places that have a very powerful effect on my life. So I'm having lunch with Joan uh, while I'm waiting to, you know, she's talking with a student. I asked one of the students to sit down and show me what she was doing. And I picked up some instructions and I brought them home. And that night I started coiling and this is the first piece I ever made. And of course I've been doing it to this day. So from 1971. And in this piece, I was coiling the bottom white and I got really sick of the white so I started throwing out this color every time I you know I just threw out some color and every time I came around to that point I would add color and this is a very small piece it's maybe about four inches high and so I worked the color in and uh, created this and then I made this egg uh, I don't know I thought it's a basket it should have an egg so this piece is also in the exhibit. It's called Rainbow Basket. 
that's good. So I would go back between coiling and knotting. This one is knotted. Coiling, you can do anything. You can change color anytime you want. You can change the shape anytime you want. Knotting is much more difficult because it has a warp. And to change the color, you can't just, you know, you have all these threads. So I figured out here to change the color, I would just, you have to take out the beige and I would just wrap in the color. So by the top, I would have nothing left of the knotting, just the color and it's all just wrapped. These pieces are maybe maybe eight, nine inches high. This is another knotted piece that's also in the exhibit from 1973. Um, as I said, moving color and knotting is very hard. So if I'm trying to move a, a line, I have to take out one color and add it in and add in a color somewhere else. So I'm in, if you see this one on the right, I'm taking out the dark green and I'm laying in the light green to move the line. This is about the same size as the previous piece. And this is a view of the inside. So the inside kind of makes a flower. And I would put beads on the inside of all these pieces because I wanted to make sure nobody would want to use them. They're not to be used. They're really there is art to be looked at and to be cherished. So I put the bead in so that people wouldn't want to cover it up. Um, so. Uh, then I did this series of long, hangings. This was this is about seven feet. It's now at the Museum of Art and Design in New York, and they're going to put it up next year. Uh, they're going to have an exhibit of their permanent collection. It's knotted. I said it's about seven feet long, and uh, each each row is a new core and the core is hair. This is yak hair. The actual, there is a title, it's called Nature Bridging. And what's doing the bridging, it's all white, except for these little porcupine quills that travel across this river. And I, I see it, um, I see some of these pieces were rivers. Um, there were about seven of them. This is a detail where you can see the porcupine quills. And then this to me is the sky and it's called mesas. Also knotted, it's the same flat knotting. There's just thousands. I, I, I wanna, after I get this piece back, I wanna count the, the knots in one row and then I can count all the rows and I'll know how many knots are in this piece. So it's just row after row of knots. And here it's wool roving it is the core and then these cliffs that are just on the very sides. This is about five feet, I think, something like that. This is a detail of, of that, of this piece. From 1974. And then I started um, this series. After I finished these long knotted pieces, I, um, I started really what became my, my work over time. Uh, this is called Container for a Wind. It's from 1975. It's also about four feet high. And the whole idea was just these openings. Um, so the wind to me, a breath can come in, it can be in the container and then it can move out. Whoops, am I? No, I think that's right. So these are three more from this period. This is the installation in the exhibit. So these are in the exhibit and this is how you would see them if you were here. Um, I call the one on the right shadow figure because when I had it in my house, it was against the wall and wherever I was in the room, I always felt it was watching me. And I would always turn around and look at it. And, and it kind of had this really interesting relationship with, like it was, I don't know, like guiding or kind of just knowing that that part of me was present, whatever that interior 
meaning of that piece is that it was present in my life and in my world and I would keep an eye on it keeping an eye on me um, the other two I don't have titles for they're kind of about the openings I think especially the black one I wanted to see if I could make an opening that was a circle um, maybe I'm missing one because that I was missing one because this is before those from, from Container for a Win, I wanted to learn how to make these pieces bend. You know, they were going around and around, straight up. So I taught myself how to piece. So you can see all these little lines that don't go all the way around. Um, they're only on top. So there's more rows on top than there are on the inside. On the outside, there's more rows than on the inside. And so this was a major piece for me. It's very small. Uh, it's also in the exhibit, um, but it was very important for me to, to learn this because then I could make pieces like this and all the pieces I've made since. Because, you know, I could try to make that open circle because I can do these piecing on the sides. And the same thing with the middle piece. Uh, this is a detail of shadow figure. I put these little markings of color because I wanted the, to me, it was like timeless earth that I was looking at and I wanted to put a human mark in that. Almost like, you know, cave paintings or rock paintings. It was the human mark. And then there's the mark here too, uh, that almost kind of a swiggle or a little tiny worm serpent. On one side, the V goes down. On the other side, the V goes up. So this is dwelling from 1984. I started um, combining coiling and twining. I wanted to learn about you know, the hardness, but also a softness. So the softness can really be hurt. you know. And some have been hurt. Some of my pieces have actually been damaged because people did not take care of them. Um, but I wanted this to um, talk about a dwelling place, a place to be. Again, the opening is there, leaving, coming, leaving. Uh, this piece is called Solitude. Also coiled and twined. It's about 18 inches high. And now they start not having any bottoms. So the energy can go straight through. Didn't have to be contained. It can just, I can be a, a vessel, an open vessel for energy to go up and down and through me. And, and then that gets manifested in the work. Uh, this is called light fan. Another image of coiling and twining where I just added on threads as I was coiling and then I had to deal with them. And as I started working them up, I saw this fan. This is an image from the exhibit. Um, this is serpent figures, obviously. Um, it's also coiled and twined. And it's about four feet, maybe, maybe a little higher than that. This is also a view of the exhibit. Uh, this is pieces called Spiral Bone and it's from the early 1990s. Also coiled and twined. They almost seem like a couple to me, maybe. They came very obviously close to each other. This is maybe the more masculine, oops, wrong direction. And this is more the feminine. And then you're seeing kind of a view of what the exhibit looks like in the background. This is a um, detail of spiral bone. I stop nodding. I only nod now when I need structure. I like coiling a lot better. Maybe because it's more freer. <laughs> uh, maybe I'll go back to nodding, who knows. But anyway, for the last several years, I've been coiling and, and twining. So the bottom is coiled and where you see these lines in the orange and the blue, uh, they are knotted. And it's, I use the knotting to make structure. This is called containing blue. 
and it has a lot of different meanings for me when I look at it. So now we're in early 2000. Uh, this is called tides. So again, here's the earth and sort of water moving through the earth, kind of the tide hitting, hitting the, the land. And also some sky, I mean, very much just nature and, and uh, something living. It's, it's also very animal-like to me. And this one is maybe also about four feet high. Uh, this is Vale, which you saw in that installation shot. It's from 1996. This is probably the most difficult piece I ever made. Uh, it's coiled, it's all hollow inside, but I, I, I coiled <clears throat> this long column and then I could turn it over. But when I went down, I had this huge column in front of me that I had to keep moving around because I'm making this this little row and I had to move this column around make each row, I had to move it around. But then I had laid on threads at the beginning, not knowing what I was gonna do. And then at the end, I laid on more threads and then I wove to me what is the veil. And this is about 90 inches high. This is quite high. And that's the detail of that. Another uh, large piece, long piece, this is Waterfall from 2000 and 2001. Uh, it was built by making this row of open circles and then building around the circles. So I see this figure uh, coming down and I also see water coming down. And these openings in the middle. So almost taking you to another place through the water. This is a detail of that. Again, these open circles. So I worked with these open circles for a while. Uh, this is called open heart. This wind. Now these are all coiled. There's no twining in these. And you can see how the openings now, these circles are at the top, like heaven or that opening into the form. string of pearls. So here the openings become pearls in this massive figure, which to me is both masculine and feminine, like the horns are kind of masculine, but then that shape of the round feminine form. The round. I started, I wanted more color. The yarn I was using, I use a wax linen thread and you can get, it's very, well, at that time there weren't a lot of colors. Um, there, you can get colors, but I still, I wanted to mix them. I wanted tons of colors. So I unplied different colors and I replied them together. So I would maybe would unply a red and a green and I'd mix the red and green together. So this is, has all these colors in like, I don't even know how many colors. This is a detail. You can see color on top of color. Um, and I'm sure the black was to make sure that it didn't get totally crazy. I don't know if I said this, but I don't have any intentions when I start. When I start a piece, I know the color, I mean, when I'm working on another piece, shapes come into my mind, colors come into my mind. Uh, and when I'm done, I usually have a color in mind. I have an idea of what it's gonna look like and I have a size in my mind. But the minute I start wrapping, I wrap a, a, just a long line and I just start playing with it. That idea sort of disappears and it's just me and the piece step by step. So this is called figurehead. Uh, the reason for that is as we're looking at it, I see a face in it. I can see uh, an eye, there's another eye, a nose and the mouth. 
And of course, this is from our period of time and we don't live in the most positive period of time. I think he is sad, there's a sadness. But then again, on the side, it looks like, um, excuse me, it looks like a figure and very queenly. So it goes from inside, sort of a sad face to this very queenly presence. And I see either a big collar or I see hair or a headdress on this figure. So we are now at 2020. We're going to go back to 2015. Uh, this is called Two Angels. It's a wall piece. Um, it's about 20 some odd inches high. And the two angels, I at some point started seeing these angels on the top. And I thought, well, I could never call it that because who, would, who else would see it? And then one of my students said, ah, they're two angels. And I thought, oh, okay, I'm not the only person seeing this. So I called it Two Angels. And what they're doing, they could be dancing, they could be wrestling, maybe both. Floating world. And I call it a floating world because it's like all that color. This is one of those pieces with tons of color where I mix them and it's floating on water. When the blue came into it, it looks like a world floating on water it's from 2007. And um, it's about maybe 15 inches high. It's also an exhibit. Some of these pieces are in the exhibit and I just didn't say that they were. But there's a detail. And you can see the piecing on the inside, all those little beginnings and endings. Flight. another view of it. I call it a flight because if you can see in the back, there's like wings, um, which um, we're not having a direct view of that, but there are wings and I felt like it was ready to take off or it could, very grounded, but it could take off. Interior passages from 2016. Um, I don't know, Christopher Knight wrote a lovely review in the LA Times and he talked about inner inner organs. And to me, this definitely has the inner organs in it. Um, so when he said that, I thought, oh, wow, it was nice that he saw them um, and experienced it. origins. Uh, so to me, um, again, these were back to being coiled and twined. The red one's coiled and twined, this one's coiled and twined. Uh, the bottom to me is the origins. And then as we move up, we move up into life. And it, for, interesting to me, this form is very feminine and also very masculine. I think of like the white to me is sort of when you see that profile in an anatomy book of a male, you know, from the side. Uh, and I and I didn't intend it. I think recently I've just been facing that I think that's what it looks like. So this is a detail of that. You can see the twining is looks like weaving and the coil is the hard part. The coiling becomes like the skeleton uh, to build the twining on. Uh, this is the last piece I finished. Uh, it's called Whispering Whale. Um, it's also about seven feet high. And I started seeing the whale maybe halfway through. So I really wanted to make a tail. And I, these containers in the whale, somehow it's the essence. And I think it's trying to speak. And I think we need to listen. We need to listen to this whale. We need to listen to what's going on in nature and our relationship. I do wanna say we are in relationship with nature uh, and it's a relationship. And how do you live in a relationship with anything? I mean, do you just take from your mate? Do you, we take and we take and we take from the earth. Do we ever think what well, we give back and you have to give back because that's what makes a relationship work. 
And if we're in the mess that we're in, it's because we do not know how to have this relationship with the earth. And I think that the earth has a consciousness, that we are dealing with a consciousness in the earth, and it is a lot more powerful than we are. This is a detail of this whale. And I think this is the last image and I wanna read you a few um, quotes to end my talk. I want, this, these are a couple of quotes by Albert Einstein. And this is where I think the feminine expresses itself. A few examples of that. So Albert Einstein said, Try not to become a man of success, but rather to become a man of values or a man of value. And he also said, most people say that it is the intellect which makes a great scientist. They are wrong. It is the character. And I want to finish with a quote, um, I think something written by Lenore Tani, who was a very dear friend of mine, and she was kind of the mother of weaving uh, in the last century. Um, she says, what is my true nature? I am the wind along the grass. I am the stream. I am the white clouds floating upon the blue sky. I am the ocean's roar. I am the cry of a bird. I am a waterfall. I am a tear. I am a river on my way to the sea. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fern. Yeah. Amazing. Um, yeah, we're going to open up for everyone's questions. I know somebody had asked um, if you could repeat the name of the initial artist whose oh, images you were sharing. Sure. Which one? Um, um, I, anyway, well, I can yeah. give you both. Helma Auckland, I know you had mentioned, um, but... Um, I'll, I'll just give you both. Great. Okay. Uh, the, the, first one, the first ones came from a book, and the book is by Catherine M. Sanford, S-A-N-F-O-R-D, and it, the book is called The Serpent and the Cross, Healing the Split Through Active Imagination, she wrote. Um, I want to say that her archives are at the Pacific Graduate Institute, you know, in the Santa Barbara area, if anybody ever is interested and in maybe even seeing the paintings, I don't know, but it looks very interesting. The other artist was Hilma of Clint, H-I-L-M-A-A-F-K-L-I-N-T. She lived between 1862 and 1944. Again, she was Swedish. And you can see her work now is every, I mean, it's not everywhere because it's really not available. She has a found, I mean, there is a foundation, I think in Sweden uh, where most of her work is, is held. And, um, but there's things written about her. She had a big exhibit at the Guggenheim. She had an exhibit before that at PS1 in New York. Sadly, nothing in LA. You can see these eight um, images of the eight watercolors on the David's Werner site. Uh, she, they were shown in New York recently and I'm so sad I wasn't in New York to see them. Um, you're also welcome to raise your hands if you'd like to um, ask a question directly to Fern. Uh, we have a question from Lynn Keeling. Could you explain the connection, how you connect uh, the oh, coiling and twining? Good question. I didn't mention that. And how you plan ahead for that I don't, intersection. I don't. I don't plan ahead. When I, when I come to it, I just know that I'm there. When I do my work, that's all I have to know is the next step. I have to know one line. I just have to see what needs to be done. Like maybe build up this area or that area. There comes a point where I just know that it's time for the twining. And what you do is you add on a warp by, you lay out the threads. I double half hitch those threads onto the cord that I'm going around for the coiling. So I'll do, I'll, I'll double, hitch, double half hitch on two threads. Then I make a connection 
you make an eight, you know, coiling, I make an eight, I wrap four times, I make a connection. I wrap four times, I make a connection. So I, when I'm laying on the war, I put two threads in by double half hitching them onto that core that I'm going around. And then I make a connection with the thread. I carry the thread that I've been working with coiling. I make the connection with the thread, lay it in and lay on two more um, double half hitch threads until I'm done where I wanna put the twining. I hope that makes sense to you. And then you can knot them off at the end, which is complicated, but I, I, I knot them off to finish them. And what I do is, I make all, all, all these knots on the top of the warp, three knots each. I lay them into the core and I know the order. Um, I, and then I cut them out and then I cut down the knots so I know the order. That's all I can say. I give workshops sometimes and you're welcome to take a workshop. Yes, we got a fantastic one with you. Hopefully we'll have another here and you're going to Haystack. I'm going to Haystack, but I'm going, no responsibilities, I'm going to play. Any specific plans of some of you're working on while you're there? I'm taking, I'm working on a larger piece at home, which I can't take with me. So what's come into my mind and stayed in my mind is take black and white. So I'm just taking some black and white thread and I'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. Also, I can work in any studio and I thought, well, maybe I'll play with clay while I'm there. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Exciting. <laughs> Um, someone's asking if the pieces are self-supporting, attached, or how, kind of how the support works. Well, they're built row by row. If you think about coiling in, in ceramics, you know how you make a coil and you build. It's the same thing with coiling. Although, as I said, coiling is a basket making technique and uh, how, how it's done with thread because in the, all these cultures have made it forever. So, it's wrapping around a core. Actually, if you come to the gallery, there is a, there is a video uh, where you can watch me doing it. So you wrap four times and I have a needle and then I, make, uh, I, I, I take the needle into the previous row and make a connection, wrap four times, make a connection and I pull tight each time. So it's hard. The form is built wrap by wrap, row by row and, and it, it builds its own strength. Twining, no, if I twine, that will not support itself. Twining always comes on the top where it doesn't have to be supported. Although, would you believe I was, I, I, there's a piece in the museum in the South, like, I don't know, South, um, the Mint Museum, they put it upside down. They put the twining on the bottom. And I thought, how could they do that? I mean, you would know, I would to think to put the hard part on the bottom anyway. That's the answer. Excellent. Um, Susan Allred um, wants to know about other workshops and how to find out. Is there anything scheduled at this point? I'm not sure where Susan is, but any workshops that you have planned at this point? No, but maybe if you email the center and say that you're, you're interested, in yeah. I'm, I'm in Los Angeles and I am thinking of maybe starting a workshop even in my home or I'm, I, I'm available to give workshops. Uh, I, I can let you know what I'm doing. Um, I used to travel and teach, but I haven't been doing that recently. Um, yeah, a couple of people have asked about your workshops and you are an incredible teacher. Um, another question kind of about the structure. I think it's hard. It's hard for people to envision how stiff and solid they really are. Someone's asking if you coil around the core. Well, the core is a polished hemp. And one of my students who took the workshop here said she's having a hard time finding it. So I'm gonna try and find it and, and write to her. Um, it's a polished hemp. It's made in Italy. You have to buy the one that's made in Italy. And you know what? It, it could be pretty horrible and they might not be making it anymore. I don't know. You know, materials changed. This was not made for our use. It's made for something else. Mm. Um, and it's, it's really made to tie springs together. It's called, it's called spring twine. Um, so I'm gonna see now if it's still available. 
And isn't there an issue with your thread as well, potentially? Uh, that you can get through Royal Wood. Okay. Royal Wood, it's, you know, our Royal Wood, it's one word. Uh, that, that, thank goodness, you can still get. <laughs> and, um, and colors and all that, the range. That they have the colors. I started by using another um, wax on a tray that I really like. Fewer colors, but really good quality. They don't make it bad anymore. You mm -hmm. can't get it. But you can get, you can get wax on a tray from Royal Wood. Um, someone's asked about storage of the work and recommendations. Of how to store it? Yeah, how to store safely your artwork. Just don't let anything sit on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I mean. <laughs> light, heat. Oh yeah, oh definitely, thank you. Yes, yeah. uh, you don't want it near heat. You don't want it in light. You don't want it in sunlight. Um, it can be in light, but not, sun not direct sunlight. I mean, if you store it, you want to store it like anything, like in a cool, dry place. Um, I don't know. Oh, I mean, see, lately, I have them stored in boxes um, in the storage area in my house. That's how I keep them. Um, and it's cool. It's downstairs, and it's cool. You can put fabric around them, but I, you want them like in a closet. You want, you want them, in, I, I'd say, in a dark Place and you want them, you know, you, you don't want bugs to get in, you know, you want it to be um, closed well. Lots of very kind comments and observations um, coming through. Um, let's see the diameter of polished hemp and can you substitute something of a similar size? Well, we might have to. <laughs> I mean, so. I, I honestly, I don't have any immediate suggestions. I think if you just try, the diameter is what? An eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch. It comes in two sizes. I think my student said she got it very thin. It, it, it does come thin. I would not recommend that unless you're making a very tiny piece. Um, you know, you can go to different fat, you know, craft stores. And sometimes even marine stores have ropes and things. You just have to start looking. If you can't find that, um, I, I really don't know. It's, it's scary. I honestly, I bought a lot of it. I think I'm okay <laughs> because I was afraid this might happen at some point. Um, but you know, too, actually I don't use it that much because I'm changing the form so often now. I build it. Up, I build up the inside with different threads. Like I build it up with wax linen because you can get wax linen in in different plies. You can get it in three, four, seven, nine, twelve. I've been buying like if I'm working in let's say I'm working in a maroon piece right now, I will buy twelve ply. I will buy nine ply. I'll buy six ply, and I'll and sometimes I buy it in natural colors because I can use it in any color any color piece I'm making but I did buy 12 ply in the maroon because then I build up as I'm piecing I build up the core and I thicken it as I go so it doesn't start out thick it starts out very thin and then it gets wider you know wider as I'm using it and then I thin it out to end it so you can do that you can build it up with different materials it doesn't have to be a solid piece of material um, Shannon Manueli asks about the wax repelling insects. I have no idea. <laughs> I try to take care of the pieces. I mean, I have my work out sometimes and um, I, I like to have the last piece I finished out for a while, you know, so that I really can live with it and see what I made. Um, I don't know anybody ever having trouble with bugs eating the wax. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll just say yeah. that. Make it more protective. Yeah. I yeah. don't. I I can't say I don't know. I, I I don't test those things, but I don't know anybody who's ever complained about it. Yeah. And the, and, and there are houses. older pieces in the show, mm -hmm. and these people have had this work out. They've they've had it out for a long time, mm -hmm. and all the work is fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, let's see, uh, someone ha still has, uh, Norman Sherfield has uh, Los Angeles waxed linen original. <laughs> um, and uh, some other comments about materials. Um, I wonder if you uh, have any last comments about seeing your work spanning this period of time all together um, in one space. I know it was. I've just been very moved by it. Uh, it's been so special. Um, I haven't seen of this. I haven't seen some of this work for a really long time, and I'm so moved. Um, seeing what I've done all these years, you know, to just see that I did this, that I made this work and, uh, and how it developed, how it changed over time, um, how I was moved from one phase to another. It's just been really special. And thank you. Thank you so much, Emily, for allowing me this experience. We're, we're just thrilled. Um... Yes, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I think we're going to wind down. There's some tremendous comments. We'll make sure that Fern is able to see all of the, the um, chats that you've all shared um, afterwards. Uh, we want to also thank um, our supporters for the exhibition, that's um, LA County, LA City, Fern Cultural Affairs, the NEA, the Lenore Tani Foundation as well. Um, and all of Craft in America's incredible supporters um, beyond. And thank all of you for attending as well. And thank you, Fern, for this incredible glimpse into what you do um, and what drives your work. <laughs>